So welcome to our Catch the Next Big Wave Symposium. Uh, I'm Jane Moores, uh, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Technology Transfer at the University of California, San Diego. I'm very pleased that you could join us for this discussion of the future of biomedical research and innovation. Uh, like the rest of San Diego, uh, we were delighted by the news that the 2014 International Bioconference would be, take place here. Um, we thought once that this would give uh, us an opportunity to host a lively exchange of ideas and perspective um, from uh, a global uh, view. Uh, San Diego and our UC San Diego campus are home to scientific trailblazers from around the world. So we know that biomedical innovation uh, flourishes when we bring together the best minds from across nations and disciplines. Uh, today, uh, four of UC San Diego's most distinguished innovators, a stem cell researcher, a neuroscientist, a bioengineer, and an astrophysicist turned computer scientist, will look into the future of biomedical research to envision the next big wave of trends and developments. Our moderator for this discussion will be Steve Fallon, uh, intellectual property attorney with Greer, Burns, and Crane one of the symposium's two gold sponsors. Our other gold sponsor is Perkins Coie, and our bronze sponsors are Gavirovich, Dodd and Lindsay, Kilpatrick, Townsend and Stockton, Shugru Mian, and Sutherland, Aspill and Brennan. We're very grateful to all our sponsors for their generous and enthusiastic support of today's symposium. I've also been asked by Sandra Brown, UC San Diego's Vice Chancellor for Research, to convey her best wishes and her regrets that she couldn't be here in person because she had a prior out-of-town commitment. She particularly wanted me to emphasize how pleased the UC San Diego campus leadership is by the increasing interactions between academia and industry. This event and your presence here exemplifies that very positive trend who has been a champion and a catalyst for technological innovation for nearly half a century. Bob Dines is a physicist and leading authority on superconductivity who has served as both chancellor of the UC San Diego campus and president of the University of California system. Bob's numerous scientific honors include the Fritz London Award in Low Temperature Physics and election to the National Academy of Sciences. He chaired a 2009 National Academy of Sciences study on advanced radiation detectors commissioned by the Department of Homeland Security. He currently serves on the boards of Argonne National Lab and the Helmholtz Foundation in Germany, amongst others. Bob knows the world of tech transfer from a 35,000 foot level, and he also knows it on the ground. He's been a faculty client of our UC San Diego Tech Transfer Office for most of our 20 year history with both issued patents and exciting new inventions in his portfolio. Please join me in welcoming Bob Dines. Thank you, Jane, and um, welcome all of you for this typical San Diego day. Um, you're, you're, you're here learning about uh, biotechnology and um, technology transfer, and, and the first person that talks to you is a physicist. Um, I'm, I'm proud of that, actually. <laughs> I'm really pleased not to welcome you here, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I've had the opportunity for about 10 minutes to share some thoughts about the future of biomedical innovation. Um, I'm delighted to, uh, to precede the four speakers who are friends of mine. They're, uh, they're colleagues of mine. Uh, we have shared uh, at least the last 20 years at UC San Diego. And, um, and I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna come back to them in a minute, but I'm telling you that they're, they're really, really creative, very smart guys, and, uh, and they're personal friends. Uh, I wanna follow up on Jane's introduction uh, by telling you about uh, a little bit about my own history because it's it's relevant to uh, to what we're going to talk about and discuss this afternoon um, and how I actually uh, I, I moved 
my own ideas and technology, uh, as a technology inventor, I moved from one coast, i.e. the East Coast, and one era to the other coast, the West Coast, and a totally different era, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain that to you. I started my scientific career uh, in the late 60s at AT&T at Bell Laboratories at a time when the U.S. commerce achieved world dominance. The U.S. basically owned the world at that time. This is my own opinion. You can debate this if you want, but you'll lose. Um, <laughs> it was the era of R&D, research and development, and, and there were very large industrial laboratories, and I was in one of them at Bell Laboratories, which spun out an enormous amount of technological innovation. In some ways, we were too successful. And over time, as industry spread their new technology around the world, competition became global and it became fierce. US companies were no longer dominant and they became global companies and, in my view, too large. Industry began to shrink their research and lower their sights towards short-term goals and quarterly statements rather than decadal goals. I realized in the 21st century, American universities would have to fill some of the void of that research that was done in industrial laboratories in the United States in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And the universities would have to take some of the responsibility for the stewardship of the nation's long-range vision and intellectual property. So I moved. I left a declining powerhouse, and it was declining. So those of you that re remember the history, AT&T was falling off the edge of the table. And came to an emerging powerhouse, U University of California, San Diego. And at the time, this was 1990 or so, at the time, it was completely liberating for me. At Bell Labs, we had pursued a single mission of research to contribute to the long-term health of private telecommunications company. And we were successful, as most of you know. At UCSD and in the public universities in the country, we pursued three interlocking missions, education, research and public service to benefit the public in an array of ways and, and a wide variety of fields, much broader numbers of fields and inter interconnections of fields than I experienced at Bell Labs. And yet, as we entered the 21st century, we still had an R&D mindset, research and development. It was all called R&D and, and, and we would um, we would pursue it, demonstrate its value, then you'd hand it off to somebody and hold your breath and hope it was successful. That was the mode. You'd, you'd pass it off to somebody else who was responsible for actually taking it to products that would benefit society. That R&D era ended in my mind on September the 11th, 2001. And I will never forget, and probably a lot of you will never forget, the site of the World Trade Center buildings collapsing. And watching first responders trapped in a building. Buildings. I knew as a research scientist in the telecommunications field that we had, we had developed the state-of-the-art wireless devices that could have kept the responders and the people in the buildings in touch with the dispatchers that were on the ground and tell them how much time they had left. But those devices never made it into the hands of the responders. I remember looking at, on television thinking, no, no, we know how to do that. But we didn't. And I'll be haunted forever by that observation. That single day, in my mind, caused a transition to a new era. We transitioned from R&D to R&D, &D, research, development, and delivery. And we could no longer afford the luxury of handing off those responsibilities to somebody else. We had, we had to move discoveries from the bench 
to the public domain efficiently, effectively, and as quickly as possible. To do that, universities had to work more closely with companies, more closely, person to person, and also to the end users, whether they are first responders in a crisis or bedside healthcare professionals, saving lives and responding as quickly as you can. Companies that develop innovations need incentives for their work, of course. If they invest time and resources in this process, they sh should expect an opportunity, an opportunity, not a guarantee, an opportunity to get a return on their investment. Universities also need to show a return on their investment, and their investment in research. This is especially true for the public universities, I know this. I've both been, had glorious times and I've been beaten up seriously um, as, as a UC president, the president of the University of California. But when legislators, the governor, taxpayers, insist on getting economic and societal value for what they invest in higher education, this new era of our d and has forced all of us in the world of science and technology to change not only how we work, but also what we think about our work. It's just a different era. We can no longer afford to operate in silos. I don't like to hear people anymore say, oh, I just do basic research. I'm afraid I'm pretty rude to those people now. We can't put up those walls listening to people say, oh, those industry people, or oh, those academics. We're in the same room now. In this new era, generating new knowledge that will serve the public and benefit society is a team sport, full body contact. And no one knows better than the technology trans uh, transfer professionals than Jane and her staff here at UC San Diego, whom I've been working with in fact, we just submitted a couple of patent proposals and we're working with small companies. I've watched with great pride as that unit has grown um, over the last 20 years. Our four speakers today, Larry Goldstein, Xu Chen, Larry Spar, and Nick Spitzer, are also longtime tech transfer clients. Each of them is a giant in its field. Together they constitute an all-star team that exemplifies what I'm very proud of at UC San Diego. They're world leaders in technological innovation. Scientists, but world leaders in technological innovation. Let me end with a few words about something the four of them have in common and something that I hope we all have in common and something that you have to remember all the time. When you listen to their presentations today, you'll, you'll, you'll undoubtedly think, geez, these guys are really smart. Brilliant, ingenious, but above all else, we will, we will sense their passion, their passion for the knowledge and, and how they're using that knowledge. As a physics professor who teaches graduate students, I can tell you that the young scientists that I deal with those with the greatest potential aren't necessarily the ones who have the highest measured IQ, whatever that is, and the most impressive publications. In every generation and in every field, the people who feel the greatest passion for their work will have the biggest dreams and take the wildest risks. Passion is what drives innovation, and that's where they're successful, and that's why we're here today. Our, success, our succession moderator has brought passion to work as an intellectual property attorney and has fought the good fight for startup companies and universities in this region. He has an outstanding track record in patent and trademark protection, but he is, at heart, a scientist with a degree in electrical engineering. Not quite a physicist, but almost. <laughs> But, but he's dealt with patents that have been licensed, enforced, and sold. Please join me in welcoming Steve Fallon from our symposium's gold sponsor, Greer, Burns, and Crane, for a few words. Thank you.